Hello and welcome to uh, a new episode of Media Snack Meets. Uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Dan Gilbert, who is the founder and CEO of Brain Labs. Uh, Brain Labs is a digital performance marketing agency. Yeah. Okay, you've had uh, a, a stellar start to your business career, right? You launched in 2000 and 2012. 2012. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was just doing a little bit of research, and uh, Deloitte had you as their number one fast track tech agency. <laughs> the FT, no less, yeah, yeah. had you as like the fourth largest European growing business. Uh, of all time. Yes, really. but they don't understand how media path through yeah. work and all that sort of thing. So I wouldn't read too much into it. But that. anyway, well, it's been good. well many it's been congratulations. Good. But Thank what you. I what I particularly liked <laughs> is is your proposition. So your your ambition is to be the smartest marketing performance agency on the planet. Indeed. Okay. So uh, what makes you so smart? Well, we're not the smartest performance marketing agency on the planet yet. Okay. Uh, that's the ambition. Uh, but I think the the unique angle that that we're taking is. Um, marketing changed quite dramatically, I think, over the last 10 years, which when you think about it is a really short space of time for an industry. Yeah. Um, uh, even if you rewind 15 years ago, the, the, the notion of biddable media, auction-driven media, um, where you could bid across trillions of different data points in real time, it didn't exist. Mm. So when that was invented, you've gone away from this, you've shifted away from this traditional paradigm where you trade media, um, resell it, you know, purchase it in advance, sign an insertion order, etc., plan it. Uh, and execute to now we're going to bid across trillions of data points and to me the skill set required to execute the latter is quite different to, to the former not that one is either better or worse yeah. than the other just that they're vastly different and and that's why we hire scientists mathematicians perform um, uh, programmers and marketers combine them all together to do what I call this new kind of marketing mm -hmm. a, kind, a more kind of mathematical marketing than than traditional media, if you want. And, and, and how, how difficult has it been to source that type of resource with those kind of skill sets and capabilities? Because I mean, normally you would go to the agency kind of resource yeah, pool, right? Yeah. And, but that's, that's not where you're looking to get resource yeah, from. Yeah, we've, we've mostly made our own. And I think if you want to challenge, um, you know, if you believe the argument and you want to challenge the status quo, um, you can't say the one thing and then look for that talent in, in the industry as it currently stands. Um, so we have a phenomenal training scheme and a recruitment program that sits into universities and trains people up in, in, in the new way. Mm. And our philosophy has always been that for this new type of marketing, um, it is easier to teach a mathematician or a programmer how to do the, the new type of marketing with you know, uh, you know, long Excel formulas and code, etc., than it is to teach a traditional marketer how to do um, uh, you know, uh, reverse polynomial formulas yeah. or something. So. It's that way. That way round. You know, with, you know, it's not absolutely extreme. We still have traditional marketing people yeah. combined with them. It's just that there's a there's a more scientific flavour to some of the stuff that we do. And, and you and you compete with the more traditional agencies, right? That have perhaps slightly more of the traditional skill set and capabilities within them. Uh, is that is that a clear point of difference from Brain Labs perhaps to, to the rest of the market? It's interesting because. In, in our space, there are literally thousands of companies that, that do what we do. So we don't really find ourselves coming up against the same people over and over again. We've kind of competed with media agencies, performance marketing agencies, digital marketing agencies, consultancies. Um, so you know, it's, 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 it's all of the above, really, without anyone in particular that keeps on coming up. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. Okay. Right. I want to, I want to uh, talk about transparency, the thorny issue <laughs> yeah. of kind of transparency. It's been it's been a topic of conversation on media snack within the industry for absolute ages. Um, we thought we'd turned a corner. Uh, we conducted some research recently that mm -hmm. indicated that perhaps uh, trust levels between client and agency have regressed further, yeah. which was disappointing. Uh, we've heard, obviously, the, the subpoenas that are being issued yeah. in the States, uh, the Department of Justice getting involved. Um, we've had Mark Pritchard talk about the murky uh, and fraudulent supply chain. So when you go into a marketplace, when you, when you mm. enter uh, with a new proposition into the marketplace, mm. uh, how have you looked at transparency as a, as a platform with which mm. to kind of share your kind of message? And what, what do you believe the most important things around transparency within, within uh, your, your, your operation? So um, we come from a, so within our business, we operate a 100% transparent uh, uh, model with clients um, and transparency means different things to different people and we'll talk about data transparency later and reporting transparency etc but I think as you refer to it currently we're talking more about 
rebates, kickbacks, markups, basically not declaring uh, whether media spend goes to the agency or to someone else. Yeah. Um, from the place where, where we began in performance marketing, it would be anathema to our business model to ever mark up media. So we've never, there's not a penny of markup in, in the history of Brain Labs. Um, because when you're trying to drive performance for clients, um, uh, you know, any, any money that you take out of there or any tra um, uh, untransparent rebates or markups, that's going to impact the performance. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to deliver the most efficient performance. So it's never really been part of our business model. Um, and and uh, you know it will disappear because the new breed of agency like ours, you know, so we're not unique necessarily in this sense. That but new performance marketing agencies or digital marketing agencies, most of them don't really operate from that model. It's kind of a hangover when you think about that history yeah. of traditional media, where the role of the media agency was to purchase media from different suppliers, lots of different suppliers, collate that, and then and then resell that to. Uh, end clients. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a completely legitimate business model. It's just that it doesn't really apply to biddable media yeah. where everyone can log into the same platform and a markup doesn't really help anyone. Um, because I, I mean, I, 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 think that, I think the market actually has changed in mm -hmm. terms of uh, you know, putting in place the guardrails to protect clients better. So, mm -hmm. you know, ISBAR, the ANA uh, shared best practice. Uh, mm -hmm. Contract frameworks. You know, we've had we've had uh, rebate clauses uh, tightened up pretty mm -hmm. much by mm -hmm. every client that we've seen. There, I think I think the the lack of transparency that is still acutely present within most organisations mm -hmm. is down to the digital supply chain. Yes. yes. And do you think that it's going to be uh, small or, or, or growing independent agencies that are going to act as the catalyst for changing mm -hmm. that. I mean, how is that going to change? Look, it's, it will come from both ways, right? The, it's clear to the, you know, the holding company model that they need to adjust to, to deliver what clients want, which is a transparent offering. But in terms of actually delivering it, when you talk about the digital supply chain, um, particularly, well, you know, within digital, you look at um, Group, Group M's published numbers and 86 odd percent out of China were spent on Google and Facebook. Mm. Delivering transparency on Google and Facebook is pretty damn straightforward. 98% yeah. of our clients contract directly with Google and Facebook. That doesn't mean that we don't supply services. Obviously, we supply services and, and charge for it, but they will um, uh, contract directly and pay directly to, to Google and Facebook because anything else is, is basically an administrative inefficiency. We receive money, pay it, and we don't mark it up. So there's absolutely zero benefit other than a busy finance mm. department. Um, so actually, delivering transparency in that regard is, 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 is really straightforward. Like, we don't have to tell our clients that we're transparent. Um, we don't even have to have the conversation. They just see it. And I think um, most performance marketing agencies come from that, that place to begin with. And I think most media agencies are moving towards that as well. Do you think, um, we'll, find a, do you think we'll get to a stage where we are, we are self-regulating? Or do you think it will require you know, a, a greater power, a government to then regulate, certainly the, the yeah. digital supply chain, just to make it, make yeah. it more robust and tighter. I don't, I don't think interventionist policies in that instance help in the same way that that's not what governs, um, you know, the consumer market either. Actually, th this will be controlled by and driven by and clients. And when clients say, uh, wise up and say, you know, I want, I want that data myself. And that's happening, you know, we were talking about in housing later. Um, uh, uh, you know, when people talk about in housing, in a lot of the, the legacy brands, what they're actually saying is, I want ownership. It doesn't mean that they want to do everything themselves, that they want to build campaigns and execute them and, and come up with a strategy and best practice, etc. Actually, what they're first saying is, well, you know, I don't want you to tell me that you're being transparent. I want to own my data and I want to contract, you know, directly with suppliers and I want to know exactly what I'm spending uh, where and, and, you know, that's, that's the emphasis of the conversation there. So I think, um, you know, to your question, uh, I think it's more driven by the end client. You know, someone can come in and I think the, the work that ISBAR are doing with the framework is definitely a useful way to push it there because it's the right platform um, for clients to understand what they're asking for. Um, but all the right noise is being made and things don't happen overnight, but there's, there's a clear shift in the market and, and you know, I don't think... Um, so you're optimistic about... about super optimistic, yeah. yeah. Um, certainly within the context of, of that portion of Google and Facebook revenue that we spoke about earlier. The, the programmatic supply chain is a little bit more murky because you've got from publisher to advertiser, you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of people in the middle that want to get paid somehow. So I think we're going to see some drastic changes in that space as well. Um, you know, as that that kind of needs to collapse, there's 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 too much in between. And so if you were if you were to provide some some advice to marketers out there that are that are you know slightly baffled by the complexities of the supply chain, <laughs> yeah. um, but are are on are requiring 
you know, to put in place certain protocols to, to protect mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. What, what, would, what, would those, what would that advice so, be? So the way that we covered it, and my advice for marketers is, is firstly, don't beat yourself up if you can't understand the, the media supply chain, because it's complicated as hell. And I spent a good couple of years trying to understand it, and um, I'm not a complete idiot, and I, I still don't get it you know, down to the T. But remember that, that being a good marketer doesn't mean remembering the thousand names of the people that are in the middle of the media supply chain. Um, actually, um, when, you, when you step back from it and um, remove the number of people or remove the number of ad tech suppliers that you actually use, that can shift the focus back to marketing. Mm -hmm. So the way that we look at it is like, yes, you can add an extra data supplier and an extra DSP and a meta DSP and a meta meta DSP, et cetera, each one of which is giving you access to 3% more inventory, 5% more reach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, reach, and, and, and free, re, reach was never the problem with, with programmatic display in the first place. Um, marketing is the problem, right? And the, the key marketing challenges are, how do we show the right messages to the right people? That's easier to do in a smaller ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, with less ad tech and maybe let fewer data providers, etc. But you know, the, the flip of that is that you get to do customer journey stuff, that you understand where the ads are actually being served, um, uh, not ticking boxes saying, you know, I've, I've, I've used all of these suppliers in the chain. There's, that's not an achievement to, to collect simplify. ad tech. Yeah, absolutely. Simplify from, from, a, from a structural uh, plumbing perspective and complicate on the marketing side. Yeah. Right? I would rather use one DSP that, that gives me 80% reach uh, than five DSPs that give me 100% reach, but on the, on the former, I've got one central place where I can define exactly who my audiences are and frequency cap across different things and show them a journey across um, you know, a specific set of advertising. Um, I think it's the, it's the industry or like the pressure on agency side that has forced us into this scenario where um, uh, people feel the need to know and use every single bit of technology mm -hmm. that's available. Um, but I think when you're a technologist yourself and understand the power of technology, I, don't th I think you're probably immediately less insecure about it from, from that perspective. So don't be confused and intimidated by the complexity. Mm -hmm. Simplify and invest more time and resource on marketing. Yeah. Is kind of uh, ab it. Absolutely. Like, let's take it back to what it really should be about, which is, which is marketing. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not an ad tech game to plug in different pieces. Um, and that will shrink anyway over the next few years, I would have thought. Good. It's that, that leads us nicely onto the topic of in-housing. Yeah. Um, you know, this in-housing in is something that we've spoken a lot about, and these are qu questions that are being regularly asked by our kind of clients. Um, just give us your kind of macro yeah. perspective on in-housing, and then we'll go into one or two kind of yeah. key details. So I think it's, it's, um, it's interesting to ask the question, what, what do we actually mean by in-housing? Uh, and we kind of alluded to in the conversation earlier. So um, when I see... Well, when you think about our business as a whole, uh, some people externally might consider 98% of our clients to be in-house already because mm. they manage their own media contract relationships yeah. and we manage some of the external, um, you know, the, the execution. Um, so by one definition, uh, in fact, like all of our clients are in-house. Um, you know, I think what we need to think about here is like a spectrum. So there are certain services that we think about that should sit with an agency always, and there are some services that should sit, or some, uh, some streams that should sit in-house yeah. always. And everything else is kind of in the middle and, and it's not necessarily um, you know, this, this absolute division between your in-house or your own agency. And when we're talking about well, what should sit, sit in-house, our belief is that contractual relationships um, uh, and commercial ownership of some of those supply relationships, um, plus data ownership, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe you know something that, that might be supported by external agencies, but but data attribution as well. Yeah. So the current set of circumstances where agencies buy, uh, attribute, measure, uh, and own clients' data is is the bit that isn't being talked about as much directly as oh someone's marking up my media. Uh, but will be the main topic of conversation moving forward because it's untenable. Yeah. Um, uh, so we think that they should own that. On the other side, the, the flip of it, um, I don't think that in-house teams will ever be able to do as, go as good a job on agencies as defining best practice yeah. um, or building technology. Um, so you know, technology or understanding the tech landscape because agencies automatically get exposure to a lot of technology and they automatically get exposure to a lot of clients which helps you build best mm -hmm. practice. Um, so, you know, on, 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 on the far side, there's, 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 um, there's stuff that, that we think agencies are built towards doing. And as long as agencies shift towards what clients actually need, there's no reason that agency billings should ever shrink. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't believe that. And every time we hear more and more about in-housing, when you look at agency billings, they seem to be going up bar 
um, you know, some reduction in, in holding company revenue. True. When, when, as a client, do you know if you're ready to begin in housing or begin the, the implementation of in housing? Um, what do you need to get done first? Well, I, th I think it comes back to those bits that, that we've already mentioned. You know, within search and social, um, you have three suppliers that control 99% of the market. So it's not difficult to contract and manage that relationship directly. There's no argument that says, oh, you need mm -hmm. this. And actually, when you look at the wider you know, digital media landscape, you could, you could justifiably buy 99% availab of available inv inventory with you know, five or six main sure. players, all of which have standard terms of service, standard credit terms, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think the first step you know, when you're thinking about this is, is, is that side of things, because it's not difficult and it's not necessarily a commitment to doing everything yourself. Uh, uh, and it lets you dip your toe in the water. Um, uh, from there, you know, there are. The, I think each business needs to consider it for themselves. Is mm. is how much capability do we have to hire talent? Yeah. Because it's important not just to be able to attract talent, but to be able to retain them. Um, and how much how much ability do we have to actually execute on this? And then carefully look at all of the different streams. And, and we might publish something afterwards that shows all the different makeups of in-house versus agency teams. Look at each of them and, and realistically analyze which ones of those can we actually do? Mm. Um, uh, because you don't need to do one thing or the other. You don't actually have to commit to I'm either an agency or I'm an in-house yeah, team. Right. Like it's not necessarily as black and white as that. Um, it never really has been, but um, uh, it, it certainly doesn't need to be anyway. Is 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 in housing a threat to uh, the traditional agency livelihood? I mean, do you consider it as a threat? I mean, if, if clients are taking more of that responsibility yeah. in-house, what then becomes your role in, in, that, in that consulting supply chain? Our role remains the same as it always has been from the beginning, which is do stuff that clients can't do better themselves. Yeah. Like it's a really straightforward business model when you think about the provision of services um, and, and most service providers understand that. So is it a threat to us? No. I mean, the, the, um, our business has grown from one to 200 people and, and had healthy on year on year growth every year um, uh, because we've built a proposition that can work for people that want a full service agency and clients that have an in-house team. Mm. Um, and 25% of our revenue comes from absolutely categorical in-house teams. So it's definitely not a problem for us. It's a, it's a challenge, I think, to a traditional business model, yeah. um, uh, but not to the concept of an agency in the slightest. It's just that the agency model has to change and um, to, to catch up, I guess, with um, clients who, who um, you know, in this relatively new industry, have realised that they need to take more control to, to, to control their own destiny, I guess. Fantastic. Yeah. Dan, I think we're done. Um, thank you so much. Pleasure. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Guest uh, 130. Nine? Well, 139 media snacks. Media uh, snacks. Very few yeah, yeah, yeah. guests. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but thank you for your time. It's been uh, incredibly insightful. Thank you. Uh, that's it for uh, this episode. We will see you next time.